Hi everyone, I'm Rincy and this is Rincy Reads. Today I'm going to be doing my favorite books of 2018 list. So the way that I do favorite books is that I just list off whatever number of books that I consider to be my favorites of the year. They don't necessarily have to be published in 2018, but they're just books I read in 2018. Um, there aren't any rereads on here. Not that I do a lot of rereads, but there are a couple of rereads I did this year. But yeah, these are all books that I read for the very first time this year. When I was going through and getting ready to sort of compile my list, I basically wrote down any book that I had like marked on my favorite shelf for the past year. And then I like eliminated a couple of them because I was like, I don't know if they would necessarily hold up to like favorites of the year sort of situation. Like they're ones I really enjoyed, but they wouldn't necessarily be my favorites. And it just happened to work out that I was able to get my list to 18. So I thought it would be nice to do my top 18 books of 2018. Now I will say that these are not like ranked at all. There is my one five star pick for the year so you guys will see that but I'm going to be going through this list in a chronological order of when I read them so I will start off with the books that I read obviously in January and then work my way down to the books that are included that I read this month. Also because this is going to be a long video. I'm not going to talk super in depth on any of these. And also if there are reviews for any of the books that I mentioned in this video, I will link to those down below so you can find out more information about any of those books if you are interested. Um, so those books will probably have like the shortest little synopsis or run through because there is more information out there if you are interested in more. But just to like help my own personal sanity with like editing this video. Like I know you guys don't mind longer videos, but for me it's going to be kind of hard to wrangle this whole thing. I'm going to run through anything that I've already talked about in an individual review really quickly. So yeah, let me just jump right into it. All right, the first book that I have on my list is When Breath Becomes Air by Paul Kalanithi. This book is probably not surprising to have on this list. I just am like one of the last people it seems like to read this book. Um, I remember picking it up in January on audiobook. It's so beautiful and so moving. In case you aren't aware, Paul Kalanithi was a doctor who got diagnosed with cancer. And so this is like a memoir about those sort of last days of his life. Um, the book was published after he had passed away and his like wife helped you know, wrap everything up and get it ready for publication and things like that. Uh, but this book is just like so moving and so heartfelt. But yeah, it's just a beautiful and moving memoir that if you haven't picked up already, you should definitely have it on your list. My next pick is An American Marriage by Tyree Jones. This is one that I have a full review of, so I will not talk about it too much. This is also one that I feel like had a lot of hype when it came out at the beginning of the year because it got picked for an Oprah's book club pick and then like the publisher ended up pushing up the publication date in order to coincide with that announcement. So yeah, there's a lot of hype around this book at the beginning of the year and then I feel like it sort of died down as obviously other books came out and people got excited about other books, but I still consider it one of my favorites. The short synopsis of this book is that you are following these newlyweds named Celestial and Roy, who within a less than a year of them getting married, uh, Roy ends up getting wrongly accused and arrested and sent to jail for raping another woman and it's about their marriage and their relationship and them working through that obvious hurdle and trying to figure out what they're going to do with the rest of their lives. This is also one that I listen to on audiobook so if you are an audiobook person this is great on audio. But yes I have a full review on this one so you guys can check that out if you are interested in more information. The next book that I have is Evicted by Matthew Desmond. This is one that won the Pulitzer Prize I believe last year and I picked it up because it won the Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction um, as part of like my New Year's resolution and I'm so glad that I did. I mean I had heard a lot of people talking about this book when it came out and it is deserving of all of that praise. What Matthew Desmond does in this book is he follows eight different families living in Milwaukee who are all extremely poor living on the poverty lines and talking about how the housing system is basically stacked against poor people in this country. The great thing about this book, or one of the many great things about this book, is that Matthew Desmond try, doesn't try to portray any of these people as being perfect. They're all extremely flawed and don't make great decisions sometimes. And he doesn't try to like villainize the landlords or anything like that in the system. He just talks about how the system is broken and how the system sort of perpetuates the cycle of poverty and how it's really hard to get out of those situations. So if you are someone who cares at all about like 
housing inequality in the United States today. I think that this is a really great primer and like first step and glimpse into what it's like for people who are on the sort of edges of society who you know, you're maybe thinking like, why is it so difficult for people to get out of poverty, get out of these like terrible neighborhoods, things like that. Like this book does a great job of explaining it. Even if you don't read a lot of nonfiction, this is a nonfiction book that you will have no problems getting through. All right, next up, I have The Astonishing Color of After by X Emily XR Pan. This is a young adult book that has a little bit of a magical realism bent. Um, This is also one that I have a full review on, so I will be linking to that down below. You are following Lei Chen Sanders, who who is this young teenage girl. She's of mixed race descent and her mother has recently passed away. And after her mother passes away, she ends up traveling to Taiwan to meet her mother's parents and to try to find her mother because Lei is convinced that her mother has become a bird. Again, I'm not going to go too deep into why I love this one, but if you are looking for a book that discusses grief really well, this is a great one. But again, there's a review for this one down below, but I adored this book so, so much. All right, next up I have my one five-star read of the year, and that is Circe by Madeline Miller. I love this book so, so much. Obviously, I have a full review of this one on my channel as well, so I will be linking to this one, but man, oh man, I cannot tell you how much I love this book. I read The Song of Achilles, Madeline Miller's first book, back in December and I'm so glad that I read it when I did because I was like so in love with her writing that I couldn't wait to read more and I was just lucky enough that I only had to wait like five or six months versus like five or six years. <laughs> but it also got me on like the Madeline Miller train right before Cersei came out. So yeah, this is a retelling of the Greek mythological character Cersei. It's so beautiful. It does such a great job of like sharing this story from her point of view and you don't have to know anything about Greek mythology although you will like enjoy the characters who visit her and things like that that she interacts with in this story if you know who they are but it isn't like required but yeah again there's a full review of this one so I'm not gonna gush about this one too much here but this is such a beautiful story that I think explores this complicated characters so well. My next pick is The Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo. Oh man, you guys, this book is so beautiful. I ended up listening to this one first on audio. This is a book, a young adult book written in verse. And so when I knew that, I always try to pick those up on audio first. And I just remember like being so enraptured by this book from the moment I started it. The writing in here is, as you would expect, so beautiful, but the story itself is so moving too. You are following this character named Ziomara or Zo. She is a teenage girl who is growing up and trying to figure out her own voice and her own point of view. Her mother is extremely conservative and religious, so she has Zo going to these confirmation classes at their church every evening or like once a week. But those those classes meet at the same time as the poetry and slam club meets at her school, which is what she really wants to do. Um, so this book is just an exploration of Zoe figuring out, again, who she is, what she wants out of life, and figuring out how to find her own voice. Again, this book is just so beautiful and so moving and such a realistic portrayal of what it's like to be growing up as a teenager, especially when the way you want to live your life is so different from the way that your parents want you to live your life, um, and figuring out how to to navigate that. Again, the writing is beautiful. I highly recommend it on audio if you end up picking it up. But obviously, I love this so much that I ended up buying a physical copy as well. And yeah, I'm so excited to read more from Elizabeth Acevedo next year. All right, my next pick is A Princess in Theory by Alyssa Cole. This is one that I would be completely remiss if I did not include it because this is basically the book that showed me that I could like romance novels. This is a contemporary romance novel and you are following this character named Neladi who is working as a scientist in grad school and she keeps getting these emails from someone who claims that he is an African prince and that they are betrothed to be married. And so obviously Neladi ends up like ignoring these emails because they sound like spam and someone who's trying to steal her identity, but it turns out that they're not spam, that this is actually a real thing. And so Prince Thepizo ends up flying out to, I believe it's New York City, uh, to find Naledi. He ends up like hiding his identity at first in order to get to know her a little bit. And obviously they end up falling in love and then things happen. This is like oh, such a 
cute, sweet, smart novel. I really like the way that the character Naledi is written. I really like the way that Prince Libizo treats her. But yeah, it's just like a modern day Cinderella type story that's really sweet and really heartfelt and also again really steamy. So if you are someone who is maybe on the fence about romance novels, this might be a good one to check out. I mean, obviously like it requires some suspension of disbelief, but if you like rom-coms at all, I feel like the Reluctant Royal series will be up your alley as well. So Princess in Theory, Alyssa Cole, thank you so much for showing me that I can like romance. All right, my next pick is My Sister the Serial Killer by Yinkin Braithwaite. This is a tiny little satirical literary thriller type of book. You are following this character named Karide who is extremely bitter because her sister Ayula is like beloved by everyone that she knows but Ayula isn't quite perfect. Her last three boyfriends have ended up dead and so Karide is pretty convinced that her sister is a serial killer and then Ayula ends up dating the boy that Karide has a crush on and she has to decide basically what she's going to do now. This book is like so interesting and I think that it's being marketed really poorly because it's hard to talk about this book without sort of getting into spoilers especially because it's a really short book. It's less than 300 pages so a lot happens in here and a lot of the more like interesting parts of this book are like the stuff that might be considered more spoilery. This is a really dark really funny really great satirical commentary of society and the way that society treats women and especially the way that it treats like not like typically beautiful women. I think that the exploration of the relationship between the two sisters is really well done and really well handled. It's one of those books that I ended up reading in a day partially because it is so short but partially because it is so compelling. So if you are looking for a page turner I think that My Sister the Serial Killer would be a great pick and I'm really hoping that more people end up giving this one a try. All right next up I have The Best We Could Do by Tai Biu. This is a book that I had had on my list of ones to pick up since it came out I think last year because it was on like everyone's best of list last year and I was like oh man I really need to give that one a try. So this is a graphic memoir following Tai Biu's life and she is basically exploring the history of her family and specifically of her parents. She explores how her family came to the United States from South Vietnam during the 1970s and how dangerous that whole experience was and how difficult that whole experience was um, but also she's exploring this from the point of view of someone who at that t this time when she was writing it was about to be a mother and was just becoming a mother um, and so she's looking at it also as like now that she's a parent looking at her own parents and seeing how much more like complicated and gray and difficult their lives were. This book is so moving and it definitely made me cry. The art style in here is really fantastic. It's like full of these like sort of watercolor styles. Everything is like this brownish reddish color and like everything is so expressive and just like so specific and just does such a great job of exploring this complicated relationship. Yeah this is a beautiful graphic memoir and I cannot recommend it highly enough. The next book that I have is The Devotion of Suspect X by Kiko Higashino. This is a book that took me so by surprise. This is a backlist book. It came out in 2012 and was like even adapted into a movie but I legitimately had no idea about this book or this author until this year. This book is honestly one of the best like puzzle mystery books that I have read in a really really long time. If you are a fan of like Agatha Christie style mystery stories I feel like this is a really great one to pick up. I haven't read a mystery book like this in a really really long time and it's honestly like my favorite type of mystery. I do have a full review of this book so I'm not going to talk about it for too long so you guys can check that out down in the description. All right my next pick is one of those big buzzy literary books of the year and I am joining the crowd and saying that I loved it. That is There There by Tommy Orange. Again, I have a full review of this one, so I won't talk about it for too long. But this is a contemporary story following around 13 different people, all of whom are Native Americans living in and around the Oakland area. And their stories basically converge on this one powwow that is taking place. I found this book to be moving and beautiful. Again, there are like 13 different perspectives in here, so know that going into it, you won't do like a super deep character dive into every single one of them and I do think the ending gets a little bit messy but 
I love this book. I love the characters in here. I love the exploration in here. I love the story that was told. I loved it a whole lot. The next book that I have is To the Bright Edge of the World by Ewen Ivy. This is such a beautiful historical fiction book. I had read The Snow Child, which was her first book, I believe, or her book previous to this one uh, last year. And I really liked that one. But the, To the Bright Edge of the World blew me away. It takes place in 1885 and you are following this newly married couple, Colonel Alan Forrester and his wife Sophie. Colonel Forrester has been tasked by the U.S. government to go to Alaska and explore this brand new territory that the country has acquired. And so these newlyweds are forced to separate. And so Sophie is left in Vancouver, I believe. Yes, Vancouver. And then Alan is sort of off on this adventure. And so the story switches back and forth between these two characters' perspectives. You see their days and years unfold through the course of like letters written between the two of them, as well as personal diaries entries and things like that. And I just think that this is a really beautiful and moving look at marriage and relationships and the unknown in life and sort of taking steps of faith and just commitment and all of those other really beautiful things. Um, if you're someone who doesn't like like straightforward romance novels, but you do enjoy a good love story, I think that Ewan Ivy does a great job of exploring marriage in a way that's really hard to find in novels. And like the way that you and Ivy writes is like breathtaking. Like I every time I read her books, I just completely fall into these worlds and fall into these characters lives. And I honestly never want to leave. So yeah, if you enjoy books with really, really descriptive, beautiful writing with worlds you can fall into, to the Bright Edge of the World by Ewan Ivy, one of my favorites of the year. All right, next we're going to go through like a string of nonfiction books because I read like a string of really great nonfiction books all in a row. The first one that I have is I'm Still Here, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness by Austin Channing Brown. This is an essay collection that I read that was just so great that I wish I owned a physical copy of it. I still plan on buying a physical copy of it because there's so much in there there that I want to like mark up and highlight and share with other people. Like I remember when I was reading this book, I kept like taking pictures of quotes and post posting them on Instagram. Austin Channing Brown in this book talks about just her experiences growing up as a black woman here in the United States. And so she talks about like her life growing up in majority white spaces and her experience in learning how to love herself and love her blackness as well as being sort of a mediator as well as someone who is willing to take the time to talk to white people and educate white people about blackness and whiteness and where those conflicts lie and sort of what like they can do to be good allies and things along those lines. Again, this is a book that's like full of a lot of hope, which is a thing I really appreciate, uh, but it's also very honest about the way white people have poorly handled certain situations. And yeah, it's just an account of her experiences growing up as a black female Christian in mostly white spaces. So I highly recommend this book. Um, if you are someone who is interested in essay collections that talk about race and culture in the United States today, I'm Still Here by Austin Channing Brown should definitely be on your list. Okay, the next book is probably my favorite nonfiction book of the year. Maybe. It's definitely like the most compelling nonfiction book that I've read so far this year, and that is Bad Blood by John Carreyrou. I feel like I talk about this book all the time, but I also feel like this is a book that I anyone could read and anyone could enjoy. This book follows the saga of the Silicon Valley biotech company Theranos and its founder Elizabeth Holmes. Elizabeth Holmes and the company claimed that with a single drop of blood, their device would be able to do all of these different tests for doctors to be able to more closely monitor their patients as well as do like really simple screenings or really complex screenings in a more simple way uh, without drawing vials and vials of blood. The problem is that this device didn't exist and any tests that they were running were all done with like other companies devices or they were like falsified or things like that. Um, and so John Kerry Rue is a Wall Street Journal reporter and he is the one who broke the story about how this company was a major fraud. It's so good and so compelling. I listened to this one on audio and I remember like starting this audiobook on a Saturday and finishing it on Sunday because I could not stop listening to it. It's completely bonkers 
what this company was able to get away with and for so long, the way that people thought that Elizabeth Holmes was this amazing sort of Silicon Valley wonderkin, the fact that Theranos got a $1 billion valuation despite the fact that they literally had nothing (laughs) is like, how does that even happen? It doesn't completely make sense. John Kerry also looks at like the terrible way that Theranos and its executives treated its employees. What eventually happened to get the story out and how difficult of a time John Kerry had sort of getting this story together and getting people to talk on the record and getting people to like openly talk about what was going on at the company. Um, One of the things he explores is about how like all of the different departments were like siloed basically so that way people couldn't really put together the pieces of how how terrible things were going but obviously like as the company was getting more attention and going more public and things like that people started to realize just how many lies like Elizabeth Holmes was telling the public and things like that and obviously it all eventually blew up even knowing that the company completely blows up at a certain point you'll still be completely compelled by the story it's so well written so well researched if you are someone who enjoys true crime or just like all of those sort of like business scandal type books like the Enron story and things like that, you have to pick up Bad Blood by John Kerry Rue. And then continuing on with the theme of non-violent true crime books, I have The Feather Thief by Kirk Wallace Johnson. Kirk Wallace Johnson looks into basically how this one guy named Ed- Edwin Rist, who was like a flautist living in England, ended up robbing one of England's natural history museums and stealing like millions of dollars worth of feathers and birds. The reason why he ended up robbing this museum is because those specific types of birds were extremely valuable within this very specific fly fishing, fly tying community. In the first part of the book, he looks at the history of fly fishing and fly tying specifically, and also like the history of these birds and why their feathers are so valuable. Then he looks at the community that currently exists around fly tying and how and why they value those feathers again. And then he looks at the heist itself and sort of figuring out what exactly happened and how Edwin Rist was able to get away with this. It's like a very surprising book. It's an extremely compelling book. Again, it's another one that I read in about a day or two. It's relatively short. I think it's also, again, less than 300 pages, but the story is just like really well written. And it's one of those that like, again, it does, it seems like too ridiculous to be real, but it is a real thing that happened. So if you enjoy a good heist story, or if you just are interested in general nonfiction around like natural history, I think that this would also be a good one to pick up. But I think that Kirk Wallace Johnson does a really great job of looking at what made a person like Edwin Rist, who has like no criminal background, no sort of previous indications that he was capable of stuff like this, do a major crime like this, how he's able to get away with major crime like this, and sort of how everything concludes. It's a really, really well done true crime book that I highly, highly recommend. Okay, three more books left. The first one I have is Indian Horse by Richard Wagamese. You are following this character named Saul Indian Horse, whose family ends up passing away and so he is forced to join the sort of juvenile center that takes in like orphan indigenous kids. It's like a really terrible situation. There's not a lot of money here. There's not a lot of space here and so Saul Indian Horse ends up helping out one of the priests who work there who like maintains this ice rink and teaches hockey. Saul ends up trying hockey and it turns out that he is actually like a really gifted hockey player and he uses hockey as this way of like getting out his like emotions and aggressions and things like that and he ends up becoming basically a local star. He ends up joining a local traveling league but joining the traveling league means that he is exposed to a lot more people who are extremely prejudiced against him and have terrible things to say to him and it's just like this really beautiful exploration of what it was like for this person to be growing up. It takes place in the 1970s in Canada and there's a lot of like really great discussions about culture in this time period in this place as well as this character who is like looking back on his life and forced to face like certain realities about things that he experienced and how that has impacted him moving forward. It's really beautiful, really moving, really heartbreaking but I cannot recommend it highly enough so Indian Horse by Richard Wagmees should definitely be on your list is one that has me wanting to pick up more books by this author. All right next up I have Becoming by Michelle Obama another one that I have a full review of that just went up this month uh, so I'm not going to talk about this one too much and also one that I don't think I really need to give a synopsis for because 
It's like one of the best-selling books of the year. Yeah, I adored this book so much. It's one that took me a little bit by surprise. I didn't think I was going to like it as much as I did. I listened to it on audio, highly recommended on audio. I don't think it's a perfect book, but I think that if you are someone who enjoys Michelle Obama as a person, you are 100% going to enjoy this book. This is one of those books where I was like slightly debating about whether or not I was going to put it on my favorites list, but I just kept thinking about the fact that when I was listening to this audiobook, I was literally sneaking in minutes of this book while I was at work because I enjoyed the experience of listening to her so much and I enjoyed the experience of like her telling her stories so much that I did not want it to stop and it's one that I could easily see myself like re-listening to when I'm like having a bad day or something along those lines because it's like so heartwarming and yeah just really really well done so yeah I would be completely remiss if I like wrote this one off just because it's some sort of like celebrity memoir or something like that it's really really well done but again yeah I have a full review on this one so you can hear me talk about the things I liked about it more and you can hear me also mention the couple of things I didn't really like about it so and the final book that I have is also a memoir and one that I just read this month and that is All You Can Ever Know by Nicole Chung. Nicole Chung is Korean American and she was adopted into an all-white family Family. And so this memoir is her exploration of her own identity, her experiences growing up as a Korean in mostly white communities, but it's also about like her exploration for her birth family. Once she finds out that she is pregnant, she decides that she is going to reach out to her birth family and it's about just that's complicated relationship that can happen between adoptees and their birth families as well as their adopted parents. I really really enjoyed this book for so many reasons but one of which is that Nicole Chung is really honest about her experiences growing up as an adoptee and specifically in this like transracial family, the difficulties that she had but also she doesn't romanticize anything about her life experience including like meeting her birth parents and meeting her birth family and contacting them and things like that she talks about how difficult the experiences were for her how complicated she felt towards different people in her life at different points and just even her own conflicted feelings and confused feelings about how she should handle these situations because you know she didn't know a lot of other adoptees especially transracial ones and so she didn't have anyone else to talk to about these experiences. So I think that this is a really beautiful, really moving book, very honest. If you are the type of person who reads stories about like adoption or foster kids or anything like that, I think that this is like a crucial one to add to your list so that way it's like a new perspective into this process and I think is very honest and very open about the process. In this book Nicole Chung isn't like dissuading people from adopting kids at all or like dissuading people from adopting kids who are of different race but I think that what she wants to do is sort of open up people's eyes to the difficulties and the roadblocks and the conflicts that they might experience because a lot of times people don't talk about that stuff. So yes, All You Can Ever Know by Nicole Chung. I'm so glad I read it uh, and I'm so glad I read it in time to be able to slip it onto this list as my final entry. <laughs> so those are all of the books that I have for this video. This is a very long video. My throat like legitimately hurts a little bit because I've been talking so much. Let me know down below whether or not you've read any of these books and if they made your favorites list or if you had to pick one favorite from the year. What's your favorite book that you read so far this year? Otherwise, thanks again so much to everyone for joining me for another year of reading, uh, for joining me for Vlogmas. I will be taking a little bit of a break, but I do, will have my December wrap up hopefully at the end of the week. And I am very excited to read more books for you guys and to learn about what my favorite books will be for next year. So yeah, that's all I have for now. And thanks for watching.